So we're preaching this morning about salvation, and that's why we started in John chapter 3. I don't think there's a better place to start here. Um, we've got probably the, the single most famous verse in the entire Bible, known by, known by people who are not even believers. John 3, 16. I mean, you see the signs up at the football games. You see at the bottom of the in and out cup. You see the reference to John 3.16 all over the place. There's people who didn't even, don't even know necessarily what it even says who have heard John 3.16 before. And the, the reason for that is because of the simplicity of salvation found in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's great news. You, you, got, you got the entire gospel essentially wrapped up into this one verse so you could tell people and explain, hey, God loves you. He wants you to be saved. And all you got to do to be saved is to believe in Jesus Christ. And, and that's, that's enough for somebody to get saved with this one verse alone. Now, obviously, we got soul wing. We don't just preach one verse. But this is, it's, it's such a powerful statement. It's such a powerful verse that it's just, it's, it's known worldwide. I mean, people, I bring this up out soul winning and, and very many times people will be finishing the verse before I even say the rest of the verse because they know it. And, this is, and praise God for that, that, that his word has gone out so strongly into the, at least into this nation to where people can just be finishing that, that. Now, many people don't think about it that much and they don't, you know, even understand it, but, but hey, it's out there. But we see such a great simplicity and just in all of John chapter 3. You know, he starts off talking to Nicodemus and explains being born again. Right? When we're saved, we're born again. We get that new spirit born inside of us. We're saved in a moment, in an instant. It happens. And just as any birth, when you're born into a family, you are part of that family forever. It's such a great um, way of explaining our salvation. It's a new birth. And it's not just figurative, it's literal. There is a new birth. There's a spirit that's born in us. We're born of God. And we, are, we become God's children. There's so much simplicity in gospel, but there's so many people today that are perverting and twisting and corrupting and trying to make the gospel difficult when it is not difficult at all. And we need to stand firm and, and, you know, sermons like this, look, I'm preaching to people who are saved this morning, but it's fine because we need to have this just, just cemented in our heads over and over again because you're going to hear different things. And, and my sermon really this morning, what's geared towards, it, it's combating this, this false concept that a person has to repent of their sins in order to be saved. I'm going to show you from scripture various reasons and, I, and I'm going to show you some different uh, um, some maybe a few different verses than, than you might have heard in the past but it's important to have this down I mean you could be saved but not have the full like just a really good grasp or necessarily be able to defend against other people who claim to be Christian who are actually preaching damnable heresies and are preaching a false gospel so I want you to be able to, to understand first and foremost what you believe and why you believe it, you know, from God's word, and then be able to have an answer for those that ask you of the blessed hope, which is within you. So you could, you could respond to them and you can call out and explain to other people who are maybe getting sucked into this notion of, well, you got to repent of your sins and be saved. And you explain to them why that's false. And it's in, in John 3, you notice you don't see anything about repenting of your sin in the entire chapter. You don't even see the word repent. You know what? And actually, you don't see the word repent in the entire book of John. The most famous passage in the whole world regarding salvation never mentions the word repent. Now, understanding repent and what it means to repent, first of all, we just need to understand the definition because that has changed even today. People hear that word repent and they automatically think Turn from sin. That is not the definition of repent right. at all. <coughs> repent, the, the, the full meaning of repent needs to be taken within the context of what you're talking about. Because the word all by itself just means rethinking or turning. It is, you know, there's turning, but it's not always from sin. We see in the Old Testament God repenting many times. God doesn't have any sin, so it's not, it's, it has nothing to do inherently with sin. Now, there are times when it can be used in the context of turning from sin. Yes, I'm not going to deny that, but you know what? You'll never find that in regards to salvation, that that type of repentance is necessary. Amen. Now, 
we see here again in John chapter 3, we have John 3, 16, we have John, Jesus talking to Nicodemus, explaining being born again, and that it's believing. John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. All throughout this chapter, it's, it's, it's real simple. Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's real simple. But the problem we have today is we have got, we've got these churches and these preachers that you can say all of these things to. And they'll say, yeah, amen. Yeah, believe. Yeah, believe. faith. It's, you know, it's not of works. It's believe. But then the further you talk to them, sometimes you'll find out. They'll say, oh, well, you gotta, you've got to repent. You've got to rep and, and their version of repentance is repent of your sins. One of the main purposes for me preaching this this morning to you is that, you know, I'm preaching to a church of soul winners. We're trying to give the gospel to people, and it's important that you know and you can help people, you know, that you can first of all identify what someone believes in for their salvation and ask the right questions. And I'm going to get to it a little bit, but there's a particular church in town that I thought and may, maybe they maybe they are, maybe they're not, but we, we, get to, we get a feeling for the churches in town and kind of how good they are based on how many people are saved that are going to their church, right? And that's what I mean by good. I just mean like a legitimate church, right? I'm not saying that they're doing everything right or whatever. I mean, what, there's, there's, a, there's a few churches out here where we kind of run into about half the people seem to be saved based on, our, on, on their answers. To our questions and one of the things I want to make sure that we don't fall in the habit of is oh you're from this church and then just automatically assuming too much in regards to the statements that they make we need to be maintaining a good focus on treating everybody the same and really asking the questions now look are there people out there that say, well, you got to repent of your sins and be saved that are saved? Yes, there are. Because usually what it means is they don't understand what they're saying and they're repeating something they've heard. Right. But they themselves have actually put their faith in Jesus Christ and trust in him alone to, to, to be saved. And typically when you go through and really start showing things from the Bible, like, oh yeah, well, I don't believe that, you know, uh, so what a person actually honestly believes is the most important thing. That's what determines salvation, right? If you use the wrong terminology, I mean, running people all the time, you got to invite Jesus into your heart or what, you know, all these various phrases that aren't even found in the Bible, but their meaning, their intention, what their belief is, is correct. If their belief is correct, then they're saved. Amen. Praise God. But we need to make sure we're diligent to talking to people and figuring out what they believe so that way we're not leaving somebody who's got a false notion of salvation and they think it has to do with them fixing up their life and doing good things because they've been told they have to turn from their sins that they're relying on that as part of their salvation and leave that person just as lost as they were when you showed up we want to make sure that we're asking the right questions so we can we can give the gospel and show people the truth and shine that light of the gospel so that, that, that as many people as possible could get saved. So, this isn't complicated. And, and that's, when you start getting people complicating the gospel, you know right away it's false. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And, and I always try to make sure that I'm not confusing people when we talk to them at the door because you also have this notion of you know, when the Bible says, what must I do to be saved? They say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people, well, I believe in Jesus, right? Yep. And if you talk to anyone who calls themselves a Christian, if you ask them if they believe in Jesus, they're going to say yes. But that, <laughs> and, and see, th this is where I don't want to make it complicated, but that doesn't necessarily make them saved because they're not only believing in Jesus. They're trusting in their own works. They're trusting in their church attendance. They're trusting in, you know, what, usually it's just their works. It's, well, I'm pretty good. Well, I've got, I mean, I can't just sin. You know, like I, there's always something added to the I believe in Jesus, which again is why it's so important to ask multiple questions, not just, hey, do you believe in Jesus? Well, great, you're saved, you're going to heaven. See, the devil is very, very, very sneaky. Yep. And he wants to cause as much confusion as possible. 
and get people into the, you know, it, to be able to answer questions, maybe right. Oh, so it's by grace through faith alone, through Jesus alone. Yeah, anyone can repeat that phrase, but is the actual belief in their heart? People can repeat, I believe in Jesus, but are they truly trusting on him alone for their salvation? Believing is not difficult at all. It's not hard. But the words that people use don't always express their true belief in their heart. Now, the gospel, very simply, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You say, you know, in Acts 16, I quoted, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But what do we have to believe? What is it that we have to believe? Well, we're relying on him, but we believe the gospel, right? Verse Corinthians 15, look at verse number one. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. So we're saved by the gospel, right? He's preached the gospel. This is what saves us. Let's keep reading in verse 2. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you. So here's what he delivered unto them. This is the gospel that he preached unto them. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So it was received of Paul, and then he's passing along to other people. This is what I received. This is the gospel I received, and this is the gospel I preached unto you, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not complicated. Jesus Christ came to be the savior of the world. He died on a cross as a sacrifice to pay for our sins. He died on that cross. They buried his body in a tomb and after three days and three nights, he rose again and came back to life. Praise God, that's the God. It's real simple. Now, there's a lot more information behind that. There's a lot more details, but, but that is, sums up the gospel in a nutshell, and that's what we have to believe in order to be saved. Brother Robert and I were talking about this last week, how, you know, oftentimes when I'm out souling, I'll bring up the fact that Jesus' soul went to hell for, th you know, for those three days and three nights, and just explaining that doctrine to people, because a lot of people, they haven't even heard that. But when we look at what the gospel actually says and what's being preached, is that the, the, the a necessary thing that someone absolutely has to believe Jesus' soul was in, those, in hell for those three days and three nights in order to be saved? No. They have to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again from the dead. Now, it might be an indicator if someone's not saved if you could just show them all the evidence in the Bible and they're just not, just not seeing it at all. But that is not this, you know, so there's a lot of things that you don't have to believe in order to be saved, right? So there's, there's many things, many, many things. I mean, the Bible talks about all kinds of subjects. You don't have to believe a certain way on every single subject in order to be saved. You have to very simply put your faith in the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, what he did for us, and the fact that he rose again from the dead and provides us our hope of new life because of his resurrection. It's very simple. Yet you, you, you're always going to be people out there trying to complicate it. First John chapter 5. Go forward your Bible more to 1 John chapter 5. Because this also answers the question, what do people have to believe in order to be saved? You believe the gospel. Very simple. Another way of stating this is found in 1 John chapter 5. It's not using the same exact words, but the concepts are all there, and, and essentially it's the same thing. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 10. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So if what we have to do to be saved is to believe, if you don't believe, then what you're doing is you're calling whoever's making a statement to you a liar, Right? If I make a statement to you about whatever, it doesn't have to be, it could be, it could be about the color of my car, about the, 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 where I live or whatever, you either believe me or you don't. If you don't believe me, what I'm saying, then, then essentially you're saying, well, you're a liar. Because there is no other, there is no gray area. You're either telling the truth or you're telling a lie. And it's that simple. And if, if, I'm, if I'm telling you a statement and you don't believe me, you choose not to believe me, then you're calling me a liar. And this is what the Bible's saying here is that, look, 
if you don't believe God, if you don't believe God's word, if you don't believe what God said about his son, then you're making God a liar. If you don't believe, then you're not saved. It's that simple. And here's the record in verse number 11. So he's, this is what he's saying. Look, if you don't believe the record that God gave of his son, then you're not saved because you're calling God a liar. And then he explains what that record is in verse number 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. It's through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ provides that life. That's how we get that life. But he says that he's given it to us, which means it's a gift. It's not earned. It's not merited. It's not something we deserve. It's given to us and it's eternal, which means forever. Eternal life. Praise God. But if we don't believe those things, then we're calling God a liar. If you, believe, if you don't believe any, of the, any part of that statement, it doesn't matter how much of it you believe. If you, if you say, I don't believe that, I don't believe it's eternal, or I don't believe it's only through Jesus Christ, or I don't believe that God's actually given it to me, but I've actually earned it. If you, believe, you, know, if you, if you have any disagreement with this, you're calling God a liar. And I would say you're not saved. Because you're calling God a liar in this instance of, of the record that God gave of his son. Right. Which is imperative to our salvation. Right. But people like to, con and it's simple. It couldn't be easier. Salvation being a free gift. We all know what it means to receive a free gift. Hey, I have a gift for you. I want you to have this. And you take it. That's a gift. Plain and simple. Being undeserving of something, yet still receiving something. You know, nothing to do with yourself. Very simple concept. I know I've received things many times I didn't deserve. I've received mercy. I've received, you know, gifts and other things that yeah, I don't deserve this. But someone decided to love me and give me something. I understand what it means to be born again or to be born even, to be born into a family. All these concepts, God makes it very clear in his word, but man comes along and Satan comes along and tries to twist it and tries to pervert it and tries to make it difficult. People have different notions of what we have to do to be saved. Well, we already saw, he that, and look, even in this verse, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And I could go through the Bible and go through hundreds of verses that say you have to believe. Yet people still want to throw in these things like, well, you know, I, I mean, what else do we have to do to be saved? Do I have to apologize for every sin that I've ever done? Do I have to go back and list all of my sins and say, well, God, I'm sorry for this sin. I'm sorry for this sin. I'm sorry for this sin. And when people come up with this notion of repenting of your sins, this is usually involved. They say, well, you have to be sorry for your sins. Now, there's nothing wrong with being sorry for your sins. I'm not saying that that's a, that's a problem. But, and I'm not even saying that that's, that in and of itself is like blasphemy or something. Say, so we could be sorry for your sins. Well, if you mean in the sense we, we have to at least recognize that we've sinned and deserve a punishment. Right. We, have to, we have to acknowledge the fact that we're sinners that do not deserve heaven and we actually deserve hell. Now, will that usually provoke a response, an emotion of sorrow? Probably. I mean, it should, right? I mean, oh, wow, I didn't realize I was that bad. Oh, you know, I mean, it's going to invoke some type of an emotional response. But does the Bible actually say you have to be sorry for every sin you've committed? I mean, it doesn't say that. You could make an acknowledgement of your guilt and understand the penalty without just being sorry for every single sin. Now, I mean, again, our heart, should we be sorry? Yeah, we should, absolutely. But the Bible doesn't say anything about an emotion in order to, for us to receive salvation. And when you start introducing these concepts, like, well, you have to be sorry, well, you know what that does? That starts to cause doubt and be, well, wait a minute, was I really sorry? Right. Was I sorry enough for my sins? Because you know what happens? Is that after a person gets saved, guess what? They still sin. And they're still going to do something that maybe they had done before. And then you start saying, well, you got to be sorry for all your sins, brother. Oh, you can't be saved. And then you start going, well, I just did this and it's a sin. 
I don't even know if I was sorry for this when I called on the name of Jesus. And then start getting people confused and doubting and wondering, well, I don't know if I'm saved. Well, what is required for salvation? Where does the Bible say, be sorry for your sin? You know where that comes from? That comes from a, mis, a, 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 a misdefined word, again, of repent. Besides saying repent means turn from your sins, they also just want to throw in there that there has to be sorrow. And you know how they do that? They go back, they go, oh, the law of first mention. Now, first of all, it's not the law of first mention. The law of first mention is not found in the Bible. There's a principle of first mention that you can apply to certain things where, yeah, the first time God brings up a word, he typically defines it for you. But that's not a law. That's not something that's just hard-coded, that's just like, this is the law of the Bible. You're not going to find that in the Bible. Because there's many words that rely on the context to understand what it means. And multiple words have more than one meaning depending on the context. So if you just go based off of the first time it's used, it's going to have a particular context. You can't just apply that with a broad brush across the whole. Well, this is what it means every single time. You can't do that. When it says that God repented that he had made man on the earth, when they were in, in the wickedness and stuff, he, he, he grieved him at his heart. Yeah, he was sorry that he had even done it. We get that from the first definition of repent. But you know what? There's other times when God's angry and he's about to destroy people and someone like Moses might intercede and then he changes his mind and decides not to do it. Doesn't mean that he's sad. It just means that he sees a man here stepping in and he appreciates that and he decides not to destroy a people. Right. There's nothing to do with sorrow. So you have to get based on the context. And, and just to apply that across the whole board, every time the word repents used, it has to be talking about grief and sorrow. No, it doesn't. And that's the only place, the time you're going to find anything about sorrow anyways is when people misdefine words. Now, do people get convinced of their sin or convicted of their sin? People like to show the, the, the story of the woman taken in adultery as a, as a great example, right? Oh, they're all convicted. How many of those people turned to Jesus? They all walked away from Jesus. Yeah, they got convicted. They got convicted of their own sins and they left. And they, I'm not saying it's a bad thing for people getting convicted of sins either. But if you're going to point to that as, as the example of, of salvation... Well, show me the person that got saved in that story. You got to be careful when people are providing evidence that, the, that it's being appropriately administered, appropriately applied to whatever the concept is. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. People say you, want to, you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Well, if the way that they refine repent, and see, you can never pin these people down either. Because you say, well, what do you mean by repent of your sins? You have to turn from your sins. If I turn from something, if I turn from doing it, but then I do it again, guess what? I never actually turn from it. I mean, if you turn temporarily, but then do it again, you know what happens? You didn't turn from it because you're there again. Right. So if you have to repent of your sins to be saved and then you sin again, I got news for you. You didn't repent of your sins. And they say, oh yeah, but I know that we're, I know that we're human and I know that we, are like, like we understand that. But if there's just this one moment when you get saved that you have to turn from so, so wait, in, in one moment I have to turn from my sins? But then after that I could just go right back and it doesn't matter? What kind of condition is that? I mean, that's silly. Oh, I turned from my sins right now. I'm saved. Cool. All right. Now I'm just going to turn right back again. And, and oh, but that's okay. That, it doesn't make any sense. But see, what the people want to do is they want to have it both ways. They say, oh, well, we know we're sinners, but you got to turn from your sin. But if you sin again, yeah, we're human. We still have the flesh, but right. you have to turn from your sins. Well, if you do it again, well, no, I did turn from my sins, but you're still sinning. You didn't turn from your sins. They don't want to acknowledge that. It is a dead end. And they're relying on their dead works. 
Turn, did I have you turn to Hebrews 10? Turn to Hebrews 10 if I didn't say that already. And again, it causes the problem of if I, turn, if I have to turn from my sins to be saved, but then I sin afterwards, that causes serious doubt. Now, after I got saved, I didn't believe I had to turn from all my sins to be saved. I just put my faith in Jesus Christ, like the Bible says. I called on the name of the Lord one night in my, in my bedroom, and I got saved because I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior to save me. Now, from that moment forward, I knew that I was saved. I was confident. I knew it. I couldn't explain it very well to you. I wasn't that knowledgeable, but I knew I was saved. For a long time after, you know, for a short time after I got saved, there's th some things I, I, I was interested in. I, I did want to, you know, I, I did want to go to church. I did want to learn a little bit more. But after a little bit of time and not really following through very well with those desires, the old person's still there, still had the same friends, still doing the same thing. And after a while, that whole thought of going to church and stuff just kind of was out of my mind. And it got to the point after many years where I started to question my own salvation. And it wasn't because I thought I, you know, thought I had to repent of my sins, but I just started, I'm just thinking like, well, how can I say I even believe this book? How can I even say I believe if I'm not really following it at all, right? And that's a good, that, that's a healthy um, attitude to have, a response to be like, well, wait a minute. I mean, what am I doing, right? And when you're, when you're in sin, it could make you start to doubt some things especially when you're in a lot of sin. But even that type of, of thinking and doubt still doesn't make you unsaved. The whole time I was still saved because I received a free gift. But what happens is, it, it, I mean, how much worse would it be if I was started thinking like, well, I didn't repent of all my sins. Then I would have been like, because even during my times of doubting, I still deep down knew I was saved. Because I believe that the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm saved, like the Bible says. But how much worse would it be if I was just thinking like, well, I didn't repent of all my sins. You know, that leads people just to throw their arms up and say, well, I can't do this. This is too hard. I mean, I couldn't even, I couldn't even do, you know, whatever. If I have to repent of all my sins and be saved, then I guess I'm going to hell. And that's the way a lot of people are. Because they think they just have to give up what may be some addiction or something they're struggling with that they just can't get the victory over. And they, just, they feel defeated. It's too hard. Instead of just receiving the free gift, they're thinking they have to do all this extra work in order to get saved. And that's what repenting of your sins is. It's works. But this comes up sometimes. What happens if a person believes and then they're just willfully sinning? Does that mean they're not really saved? Because there's many the people who believe in repenting of your sins, they'll say, oh yeah, there's no way they're saved then because if you're just willfully sinning, you can't just do that. I mean, you're not saved. Well, let's look at Hebrews 10 and see what the answer Because Hebrews 10 actually talks about people who are willfully sinning. Look at verse number 26, Hebrews 10. The Bible says, For if we, if we, sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant. Look at this. Wherewith he was sanctified. So is this person saved? He's sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Yeah, I'd say this person's saved. An unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. This is talking about a person who got saved but still sinned willfully after being saved. Say, nope, I'm going to do this. I know that Jesus Christ paid for my sins. He died on the cross. And what's he doing? He's treading underfoot the Son of God. You're trampling. When you just go off and sin willfully, it's showing that you despise Jesus Christ, that you don't care what he did for you on the cross and that you're just going to do whatever you want to do and you're going to trample them under your foot. Now, is that very loving? No. no. Is that what we're supposed to be doing? No. 
Look what it says in verse 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense at the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. If you're born again, you are God's people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, at no point does this say you're going to hell. It doesn't say that. If you sin willfully, it says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Absolutely. It, it, it's explaining, is God going to punish you? You better believe God's going to punish you. If you're a child of God and you just go off and willfully sin and disregard God, guess what? God's going to punish you. But nowhere does it say that God's going to cast you into hell and take away your eternal life and you're going to be unborn from being born again. This verse even says you, he was sanctified. Set apart. He's washed in the blood. The sins are eternally forgiven. But that's why it also brings up Moses' law. Can a person be saved and break Moses' law in the Old Testament? Yeah. What happens if they, if they break one of, one of the, you know, the Old Testament laws, one of the laws of Moses? You know, especially, a, a, this is talking about a, a, a law under, uh, unto death. So what is he going to die without mercy under two or three witnesses? If he's committed a crime that's, that's worthy of death, well, yeah, they're going to be two of their witnesses. They're going to put him to death. And he's saying now they're not under the Mosaic law anymore. So how much more, though, is it going to be, you know, what of a punishment they're going to receive who have trodden underfoot the Son of God? And he's saying, you know, it's one thing to break the law of Moses and then, and then you got that recompense of, you know, the death penalty. Well, when you're no longer under the law of Moses... God's going to be dealing with you. The human government isn't dealing with you appropriately because you're not under the law of Moses anymore. So now, God's going to deal with you. And that's a fearful thing for God to be judging you. And, and here's what people look at. They look at verse number 27 and say, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. They say, oh, see fiery indignation, that's hell. That's not hell. It's a fervent, fiery indignation. It's, a, it's, it's God being very angry and judging you. Just as God brings judgment, it says, which shall devour uh, the adversaries, God brings judgment upon wicked people and wicked nations all the time in this earth. But it doesn't, this isn't talking about hell. If you decide to be wicked, and choose to, to willfully sin, God will judge you the way he judges all the other wicked nations of the world, the way he has judged them. He said, you're going to be judged. But it doesn't mean that you're not saved. So this is, this is the perfect example of someone who's, who's, and look, it says he was sanctified and they're sinning willfully. So if a person sins willfully, does that mean they're not saved? No, because we have an example of someone sinning willfully that was saved. And again, proving eternal security, there's many ways of doing that, but just so you don't get confused about this passage. And if someone were to say, oh, well, you can't, you know, you, you were never saved if you sin willfully. Well, here's an example in Hebrews 10. Turn if you to Matthew 17. Belief is simple. We don't want to make it difficult. Well, how much do you have to believe? Do you have to be willing to turn over control of your life to Jesus? That's lordship salvation. God's not requiring us to become his slave in order for it to be saved. He's requiring us to receive a free gift. There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference between indenturing yourself to be the servant of someone else and receiving something for free. Way different. On my daughter's birthday, when, when we give her gifts, we don't say, okay, now you're our servant forever. Here you go. Here's your gift. It's not the way it works. It's not a gift. How much do we have to believe? Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus answers. He says, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. 
He's talking about moving mountains. And in the context of this verse, he's talking about um, that his disciples were asking about being able to cast out devils. Now, if you only need the amount of faith to, to move a mountain as a, the seed of a grain of a mustard, mustard seed, how much do you think you need for salvation? It's not that much. You don't have to have all faith of just this, you're just overflowing with faith. Now, you have to believe with all your heart. Some people don't have very much faith at all. Whatever faith you have, you, you put that in Jesus. So we're not trusting in anything else, but, but you don't have to make it into this difficult thing of like, well, I don't know if I had enough faith. You don't have to quantify it. You have faith as a, as a grain of mustard seed. The Bible said here, and, and in Mark 4.31, the Bible says, Jesus Christ himself explains that the, the grain of a mustard seed, which when it's sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. Just so you understand that. Because you might not even know what a, what a mustard seed looks like. I know I don't. But Jesus said that it's, it's less. It's, it's the smallest seed on the earth, basically. It's, it's, it's less than all the seeds that be in the earth. So that's not asking much at all. Whatever faith you have, you just put it in Jesus Christ. But you see, the hypocrites that believe in this, oh, repent of your sins, and they want to judge who's saved and who's not based on the sins that they commit. The hypocrites will determine the other people's sins, prove they're not saved, but their sins, of course, they're not that bad. Right? right? Turn if you to James chapter 2. And all it is is hypocrisy. Because they're looking at other people and saying, oh, yeah, your sin, well, you can't be saved because you're willfully sinning or you can't be saved because you're doing this sin or that sin. You're, you're drinking alcohol or whatever. Now, we know that the cults, the cults of Mormonism, the Jehovah's False Witnesses, we know that they're always looking to add works to salvation, and that's, that's nothing new. I mean, all the false religions do that. And, and those cults specifically they come up with this concept of making faith and works inseparable. So this is what they've done. And, and this is how they get around when you say things like, oh yeah, believe in Jesus. Oh yeah. That's, they're fine with that. Because what they do is they take that word believe and say, well, if, you're belie if you believe, you have works. And if you don't have works, you don't believe. And they just, just, they just go, here's works, here's believe. Here's faith, here's works. It's, it's, they're just, you can't separate the one from the other. So when you say things like, it's by grace through faith in Jesus, it, you know, it, yeah. Because if you have faith, you're doing the works. If you believe it, you're, and, and they're, they're, this is what they believe. And that's why the, the New World Translation says, is always saying like active faith or exercising your faith or doing, you know, it's, it's always these, these, these verbs added to it that, that's implying a, um, a work, an effort. Right. It's not just faith. It's not just believe. It's, it's, it's more than that. And even the modern versions do that in, in many cases, too. It's not just their, their complete atrocity of, of what they want to call a Bible. It's uh, these other perversions of the Bible as well. Now, I ran into the pastor of Canyon Bible Church recently. We're out soul winning. And I don't, you know, I don't know all the details, because we know there's one in town here, but then they split or something, and he's pastoring in Prescott instead of in Prescott Valley. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a respecter of persons. So when I'm out soul winning, I don't care if they say they're, I don't care if they say they're the Baptist, uh, uh, a Baptist pastor. I'm going to ask them if they're saved, no matter who they are, no matter what their accolades are, I'm going to ask them, just like anybody else, what they believe it takes to be saved. Because why should I respect anybody's person? Why, and why should I just assume? So I actually had, I had some really good, when I, when I started talking to this guy, I was thinking like, cool. You know, I was like, a lot of times you know, I meet pastors and it's just like, oh great, you know, like, don't even want to deal with it because a lot of them are just hard-headed and they don't even want to talk to you and stuff. And it's like they've got, there's some just total apostate church that's just work salvation and, and whatever, right? I mean, it happens quite often.
But then, uh, but this guy, I was thinking like, well, I know that we've talked to a lot of people that have gone to that church and that, you know, like, I'm pretty confident that they're saved and they're, you know, it's like, oh, well, so, uh, this will be interesting to see. So I asked the, the simple questions. So, uh, you know, like, like salvation, I think I even, I asked him, you know, and he's, you know, salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, you know, like, great, cool, you know, and, 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 and I could have left it at that. And just walked away thinking that, like, oh, this guy's, you know, it's a good guy. He's believing the same thing. But I kept talking a little bit, and just because a lot of these guys, and I'm not going to make any false accusations against this guy because I don't know his heart, but oftentimes you get, a, you get a feeling that there's some pride there. Okay, and I, and I you know, and, and I try to deal with that appropriately. I don't want, I'm not there just to, 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 invoke a response from him and try to, to get him all mad or whatever and, and lift it up in himself even more. So I don't, and, and again, I, I'm trying to be real careful here because I don't, I don't want to make a false accusation. It's just a feeling that I was getting, I don't, and I don't know if it's, if it's accurate or not. So in order to try to have a conversation without being accusatory, I just start, I just start talking about different things, about what we believe. Oh, well, we believe, you know, this, and I just said, yeah. And I was just kind of going on about soul winning and why we're doing this because I know they're not going door to door. And they're just saying, yeah, we, you know, we talk to different people and we get these different types of answers. And then I hit the, the repent of your sin. I said, yeah, and one of the things that just, that just seems to be really popular today is this concept you have to repent of your sins to be saved. And I went in how, you know, like that's a workspace salvation all this stuff. And he said, well, I actually disagree with you on that. I believe, you know, I believe the exact opposite. So that brought up, that opened up that door. And I was just like, Wow. Because all of the other answers were, were right on. Right. And then we get to this. And so I showed them Jonah 3.10. The Bible says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented the evil he thought to do. And, then, cause, and as soon as I said Jonah 3, he was like, oh, you said God repenting? I said, well, yeah, God repents. But because he didn't have a problem with God repenting. I said, but, but look at this. I said, And God saw their works that they turn from the evil way. So the Bible is calling turning from your evil way or turning from your sins works. You know what his answer was? Well, that's just one verse. Well, I'm sorry. How many verses do you need? And then you know what he, he jumped to straight after that? James chapter 2. Of course. James chapter 2. Of all things, James chapter 2. Hello, Mormon. Hello, Jehovah's Witnesses. Now you're going to yoke up with them and say, oh, well, faith without works is dead. Because the person that goes to James chapter 2 to justify work salvation is doing just that. You're justifying work salvation. You're trying to say, see, you have to have works to be saved. And he unknowingly, I think, did this because in his heart, he's believing works-based salvation. And he's trying to justify it. But he doesn't want to call it works because he knows that the Bible says it's not of works. So you have to get around that somehow. Right. But you can't. Right. You can't get around what the Bible says. Amen. At least not be consistent with it. You're in James chapter 2. We're gonna, I'm going to go through some James chapter 2. James chapter 2 can be confusing for a lot of people. I don't want anyone in our church confused about what James chapter 2 is talking about and allow anybody to turn your head around about what salvation is because it's so important. Salvation is not of works at all. And people want to spin it around and combine words and make it confusing and make you think that, well, if I'm not doing any works, then I didn't ever really believe. That's false. In James chapter 2, we're going to start reading in verse number 8. Because I think it's amazing that he would even turn to this as a repent of your sins. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, If ye fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Look at this next verse, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. What good is turning from your sins for salvation when all it takes for you to do 
is to commit one sin and you're guilty of all. You're guilty of all. You have to turn from your sins and be saved. Well, which sins? All of them is what they'll say. You have to turn from all of them. Well, as soon as you sin, you're guilty of all of them. How can you say you've turned from your sins? Because as soon as you commit sin, you're guilty of all. Right. According to James, and you want to go to James 2 to justify you have to repent of your sins and be saved. James chapter 2 is, is just magnifying how much sinners we are and that we need a Savior and someone just to save us and has nothing to do with our intent to sin or anything with, with our desire to sin or a turning from sin. How can anyone ever know if they have repented of their sins? How could you even know? What, what is involved in that? Is it just a feeling? Because that's what the Mormons rely on. It's a feeling, right? Is it a decision? Because again, I'll go back to the same thing. If you make a decision to turn from all of your sins, but then you sin again, you didn't really make that, you, you didn't follow through on that decision. You failed. And, oh, guess I didn't turn from my sins because I did it again. If you turn from doing something, but then you go back and do it again, do you have to repent of it again? See, now you get into this, oh, well, I repented from all my sins, but then I got drunk again. So I got to repent of that again, and now I'm saved. Is it, is it back and forth, saved, not saved? I mean, this guy didn't believe that you could lose your salvation, supposedly. Because I asked him about that too, and that was, that was right on. But then it's like, well, how did you get all... And you know what? The guy might be saved. You know what he said to me? He said, he said oh, I used to believe like you. Right. But now he's, you know, so much... Because he, he said, well, you know, repent is metanoia in Greek. Oh, oh, yeah, tell me about Greek. I guarantee you the guy is not fluent in Greek. But he wants to sound smart. Oh, well, you know, metanoia. What does it mean? Oh, it means repent? Yeah, thank you. I already knew that. Yeah. <laughs> and give me all these stupid, you know, try to sound so smart, but I I've done this long enough. I know where he's going with it all. And it's just nowhere. He's going nowhere. He's repeating what he's been told. He's repeating what he's heard from somebody else, from some other man. And none of it makes any sense and none of it jives with the Bible. If you don't have, why, why would you not, if, if repenting of your sins is required for salvation, why wouldn't you have to always keep repenting then? If you go back. It doesn't make any sense. Why is it a one-time thing where you want to change your life to not sin? And by the way, think about this. Repenting from your sins. If, if you repent from your sins, what are you doing? You're obeying the law. Think about that. If you turn from your sins, you are embracing the law. Because sin is the transgression of the law. That is what sin is defined as in the Bible. When you sin, you're breaking God's law. So what they're saying you have to do is turn from your sins and embrace the law. So wait, I have to rely on keeping the law now to be saved? The Bible says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. So if you can be saved, if you're justified by faith, Without the deeds of the law, guess what? You don't have to turn from sin because when you turn from sin, that's the deeds of the law. H how do you not see, you know, how do people not see this? When you don't sin, you're following the law. When you're not following the law, you're sinning. And Jesus said it has nothing to do with the law. The Apostle Paul said it has nothing to do with the law. It's completely removed from that. So turning from your sins has nothing to do with salvation. Turn if you, or you're in James 2. I'm going to keep on going here. If we turn from our sins, we'd have to be turning to the law. Keeping the law is works. And why would you want to be brought back under that bondage to save your soul? Look at verse 13. The Bible says, For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. And this is important, verse 14. What doth the prophet, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? So right off the bat, we have a, we have a question. What is the prophet? What good is it? 
What good is it for um, a man to say he has, does this even say that the man has faith? No, it says a man says he has faith. Are there a lot of people that say they have faith in Jesus? Yeah, that are not saved? Yeah. So, right off the bat, we have an example of a man that says he has faith. We don't know if he does or not, because the Bible doesn't tell us. He's, just, he's saying he says he has it. And have not works. Can faith save him? So, again, another question. Can faith save him? Does it say faith cannot save him? If you're going to believe what you believe on a question in the Bible, you're on pretty shaky ground. If you're going to stake your salvation and say, nope, salvation means you have to turn from your sins. Nope, you've got to have works in, in, in combination with your faith in order to be saved based on a question. Verse number 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Say, what good is it if someone comes to you and say, oh, I'm hungry, and you say, yeah, be filled. But you don't actually do anything to help them out. Of course that doesn't profit any. It doesn't profit them anything. Does it change your state at all? When someone comes to you with something and then you just... You don't do anything for them? Not really. You are, you know, if you were, if you were, hung, if you were already well-fed before, you're going to remain well-fed. That person doesn't profit at all. The person that came to you. Verse 17, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. And this is the same, this is the question I said, well, is it possible to have faith and not have works to the guy I was talking to? And he said, no. Well, then why does the Bible say that faith without works is dead? If it's not even possible to have faith and not have works, then how do you explain this verse? It is possible. Of course it's possible to have faith and not have works because then your faith dies. If you have faith and then your faith dies, does that mean God takes away your eternal life? Where does the Bible say that? Where, where in this passage does it ever talk about eternal life? Now it says saved. But again, does that, is it talking about your soul being saved? Because just the word saved by itself does not imply a spiritual salvation. You have to remember that too. When you're looking up someone being saved, again, it's taken in context. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, again, here's someone just saying, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And this is what, you know, they always want to go to this. They see, believing's not enough because the devils aren't saved. Uh, yeah, it says, thou believest there's one God. Believing in one God, being a monotheist, does that make a person saved and go to heaven? No. no. Thomas Jefferson believed there was one God, right? Wasn't he a monotheist? But he butchered the Bible and literally added in, or I don't know if he added to, be removed from God's word and came up with his own. And I, I, I believe that guy's burning in hell right now. But he was a monotheist. Yeah, being a monotheist doesn't mean anything when it comes to your salvation. I mean, yeah, you have to be a monotheist to be saved because you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. But this isn't saying believing on the Lord Jesus Christ that the devils also believe. Of course the devils believe there's one God because they know who God is. Verse 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And, and look, this chapter is an admonishment to have works. Right. Of course it is. Right. I mean, if you have faith, why don't you show people the faith that you have by doing good works? Why don't you have a lively faith and do things and don't let your faith just die? This is not a passage about salvation. This is a passage about doing good things and doing good things in front of man and in front of people. We see what's going on here. We, we get the example of one person, one man, a man saying he has faith, and then another man saying, well, hey, you know, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. This is man involved with man in showing your faith to other men. That's what this passage is talking about. Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness 
and he was called the friend of God. You see that, you see that look at this, you see that in how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. How? How is a man justified by faith? Eternally, spiritually? No. It doesn't tell us that. It says, so giving these examples of someone coming to you and not, and not receiving any benefit, not being profited by your faith or by your statements, but then when you actually do the work, it profits somebody else, that's how a man is justified by his works and not just his faith. You're justified in the eyes of man. People can see your faith when you're doing good works because they could see your works and know that you're doing that based off of your faith. That's how you're justified. You're justified by what people see. Uh, verse 25, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Amazed, it amazed me when he went to James 2. Are like, you really going to go to James 2 to justify repenting of your sins for salvation? Because what you're doing there now is trying to say that you have to have works to be saved. Because that's what the JWs and, and Mormons do. They do that all day long. They, lo they love this passage. They want to go to this and try to show you, see, you have to have works. This doesn't say you need to have works to have eternal life. And if you have works, it's not a gift. If you're working for something, it's not freely received. This can't be talking about your eternal life in that sense of salvation because then you have a contradiction in the Bible. I mean, if you have a stark contradiction. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. There's another thing this guy brought up. And, and again, it's, it's, like, it's like he's using the, the, the Mormon playbook. Seriously. Ephesians chapter 2, because all he did was quote verse number 10 and left out verse 8 and 9. Because verse number 10 says, for, Well, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Yeah, we're, we're created to good works. Okay, where does that say that if I don't have works, I'm not saved? Where, where does that say, oh, wait, well, wait, why don't we try reading in verse number eight before we get to verse number 10? Because verse number eight, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, explain this to me. We saw in James 2, the Bible said, faith without works is dead, being alone. Ephesians 2 says you're saved through faith and that it's not of works. Is it possible to have faith without works? Of course it is. And when you get saved, it's only by faith. After you get saved, after you get saved, which is where we're at in verse number 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Does it say that we will walk in them for sure because you're saved? Does it say that you automatically will do good works because you've, you've been saved? No. Actually, the Bible says that we struggle. There's a battle going on constantly between our spirit and our flesh. Why? Because you're not automatically going to do good works. You're not automatically going to be obeying the law. You're not automatically not going to be sinning. You have to fight against those things every day. We should walk in them. Yeah, we were created to do good works. That's what we should be doing. After you get saved, yeah, you should be showing your faith and doing good works. Absolutely. Amen and amen. That does not change the requirement for salvation, though. And I, you can Ephesians 2, 8, 9 through, 8 through 10 explains that, that it's not of works, that yes, it's faith and no works. Romans 4 says the same exact thing. Turn to Romans chapter 4. And this is another thing that I think people have a, lot of a problem with is the words faith and believe. You know, faith and belief have the same meaning. It's just that believe is a verb and faith is the noun, right? Verb is the action, believe. 
When I'm believing, it's an action. I'm believing something. Faith is what I have. I possess. It's a noun. It's, it's an object, if you will. I mean, it's, a, it's a, an imaginary object. It's something that exists, but it's not a, it's not a tangible thing. But it's, it, it is my belief. When I believe something, that is my faith. Believe is the action. Faith. I know, I know this is real difficult, right? Real difficult to grasp. That's why you find the verses that say, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you have verses that say, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. Because believing and faith are the same thing. Just a matter of how you state it in English grammar. The reason why I bring that up is because the Bible is very clear about when you believe there's no works. You're just believing. You are just believing, but then they want to back in the works by saying, oh, faith without works is dead, as if faith is something different than believing. Your faith is your belief. When you get saved by believing, you're saved by faith. It has nothing to do with works. Romans 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, what shall we say then? And you know, and this helps in understanding James 2 because James 2 brings up the story of Abraham offering up Isaac as a sacrifice, right? And it says that his faith was made perfect, like complete. Yeah, of course it was. First, he believed God's promise to him before Isaac was even born. He believed God, that God was going to make of him, he was going to give him a seed, and he was going to multiply him as the stars that are by, you know, in the heaven. And the sand by the sea, like he's, he's going he's to multiply him and give him this, you know, make nations of him, of his seed of promise, which was Isaac. He believed God. Sarah conceived. Isaac was born. He continued to believe God's word. So when God asked him to offer up his son as a sacrifice, he said, okay, I'll do it. Why? Because he knew that God was able to, to, to keep his promise that God doesn't lie. And because he believed that he had that faith, he said, well, I don't know what God's planning, but he's already made this promise to me, which he's not going to take back because God doesn't lie. So if he's telling me to do this, I know that somehow it'll work out, even if he's going to raise him up from the dead. Why? Because, girls, stop screwing around right now. Because he knew the gospel. He knew that there was going to be a savior and he was acting out what was going to happen to Jesus Christ. That was a, whole, a big picture of Jesus Christ. Elizabeth, shut your mouth. And he knew that God was able to raise up his son even from the dead, if that's what he wanted to do. But he, had, he was confident and had faith in that. So by acting that out and going through all the way to the point where he was going to kill his son, his faith was perfect. Why? Because he was showing that he did believe this. But that's not when Abraham got saved. <laughs> Which, again, shows that James 2 is not talking about salvation. Oh, Abraham finally got saved when he was going to offer up his son as a sacrifice. When he was willing to give a sacrifice of himself. That's ridiculous. Abraham got saved way earlier when he believed God. Romans 4, same story. Verse number one. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, and wasn't, isn't that what James 2 is talking about, being justified by works? If Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory. Can Abraham glory of the fact that, hey, I, gave, I was give, willing to give everything to God? Of course he could. Before you and me and, every, you know, and, and among men. He could glory in that. He could say, I, I was willing to not even withhold my son from God because of my works, what I was doing. If Abraham were justified by works, he had the word of glory, but not before God. He could glory before man. He could profit men. Other men could look at him and see his faith. He could be justified in the eyes of man. Wow, look at the faith of Abraham, what he was willing to do. And people have respect to that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but that's not how he was justified in the eyes of God. Right. 
Verse number three, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted on him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. When you do good work, that's, when you get a reward for that, that's not grace. It's not what grace is. It's a debt. It's owed to you. When I work for my boss, he owes me money because I've done something for him and he owes me. I've worked for it. I've earned it. But when, I, when, it's, when it is grace, it's not deserved. It's not earned. It's just given to you. That's why verse number five says, again, look at this. But to him that worketh not, but believeth. Well, faith without works is dead, right? Yeah, it is. James 2 says so. Absolutely it is. Is that talking about our salvation? No, because actually in reference to our salvation being justified before God, it says working not and believing. Is it possible to do no work and believe? You better believe it is because that's what gets you saved. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without, without works. He said, without works. Turning from your sins is works. Obeying the law is works. God imputes righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. I already quoted Romans 3.28 for you. Therefore, we conclude that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. When you're going through, the, when you run into a repent of your sins person, show them Jonah 3.10. Because that defines turning from your evil way as works. Show them Romans 4. Because it tells you that someone can have no works and believe at the same time, and that's what saves them. Show them Romans 3.28, that it's by faith and not the deeds of the law. If you're turning from your sins... You're keeping the deeds of the law. See, what they do, and, and this is another slick way when they say, oh, you turn from your sins to the Savior, right? Because that's how they add Jesus to it. Right. When really, if you're turning from your sins, you're turning to the law. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The repentance that's required is, let's say I believed in Buddha or Allah or what other false god, Krishna. The repentance that's required for me to get saved, I have to turn from Buddha to Jesus. That makes sense because you're turning from a false God to God. You're turning from a false belief to a true belief. That is a, a, a proper repentance that even makes sense with the word. Well, I repented of being a Catholic and I became a believer on Jesus Christ. Right. But when you turn from sin, you can't just insert Jesus and have it make sense. You're turning from sin to doing no sin. You're turning from doing sin to not doing sin. And guess what? Not doing sin is the law. It's slick though. And that's how they deceive people. Because it sounds good when you say turn from sin to the Savior. Right. Sounds good. Rolls off the tongue. Real nice. Right. Total lie. Total lie. Perversion of the gospel. Turn forward to Acts 19. We've all, I'm not going to have you, I know we're going kind of long this morning. I'm almost done. I'm last, just a couple more things I just want to add here. We've already read this passage before, Hebrews 5, the end of Hebrews 5 and beginning of, of, verse, of chapter 6. The Bible says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. This is describing that pastor that I talked to. For the time he ought to be teachers, and he thinks he is a teacher, and he's going off and teaching people. And for the time, I'm sure he's invested a lot of time in studying and everything else. I don't doubt that. But he's become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Why? Because the gospel is milk. The gospel is, is what produces a newborn babe. The gospel is super simple. And when you pervert the gospel and, and you start teaching a false gospel, you know, if, if I hope he's saved. I hope he is. I don't know. I mean, it, it's pretty bad to be, to be 
teaching this repent of your sins nonsense, but I've known people, I do know people that used to believe this that are saved right. and would say these things. So I'm not just going to go off, off, you know, and say that, just make the, this accusation that I know for sure he's not saved. I don't know. Because he also claimed to believe what, what I was saying. And if he did, then, then he was saved. But he's definitely in need of milk. The Bible says, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. And he's unskillful because he's turned to James chapter 2 to prove that you have to repent of your sins and be saved. Very, very much so. Verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the, of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again. Look, and these are the things that are milk. The foundation, the foundation of repentance from dead works. You're not repenting from sin. You're repenting from keeping the law to, as, a relying, as your reliance on from your salvation because those are dead works. When you don't have faith and you're trying to keep the law, those are dead works. That's what it is. Faith without works is dead. Works without faith is dead. You need to turn from those dead works where you're just trusting in how good of a person you are. You're, you're trusting in, oh, I turned from my sins. I repented of my sins. Dead works. Can't save you. That's the foundation. Learn the principles, the first principles, the foundational truths, again, if you think you have to turn from your sins and be saved. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You're in Acts chapter 19. It's the last point. Because people say, well, didn't Jesus preach repentance? Didn't John the Baptist preach? Yes, they did. But it's what, is he, what did they mean by it? They didn't. I already proved that repenting does not necessarily mean turning from sin. It's all based on the context. But you know what's great? We only see a few verses, literally, in the, New, in, the, in the Gospels, where Jesus or John the Baptist said, repent. And usually they said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, or repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or repent and believe the gospel. Right? That, that's it. We don't get the full, like, everything that they were saying, everything they were expounding. We see when those words repent are used, it's, it's, it's very short. It's very concise. But you know, we do have in Acts chapter 19, we have the Apostle Paul explaining what John the Baptist was teaching when he said to repent. We have the explanation given to us very clearly of what he was teaching when he was telling them to repent. And guess what? It doesn't say he was telling them to repent of their sins. Look at verse number one, Acts chapter 19. Highlight this in your Bible. You're going to highlight verse number four. Very, very good verse to use for repent of your sins, people. You're out soul winning. Verse number one. And it came to pass that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism, right? So they're baptized by John the Baptist. It was John's baptism, right? Verse number four. But they obviously weren't saved. He knew they didn't, they didn't, they didn't believe right. So they're accidentally baptized, not believing right. And he tells them here, verse number four, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. So what is this baptism of repentance that John was preaching that he was baptizing people with? And that, he, and that they had to believe in order to be baptized, right? The baptism of repentance. He baptized people the baptism of repentance. And when he said, repent, and then he would baptize them, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. That was the baptism of repentance. That was the repentance that John the Baptist was telling people to believe. Believe on Jesus Christ. That's what he meant when he said, Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Believe on Jesus. Amen. It's simple. And that is salvation. Why did they have to repent? Because they weren't believing on Jesus. They were believing in themselves. They were believing in the law. They were believing in Moses. They were believing in something else. They had to change that belief. They had to turn from that belief. They had to stop believing that they can make it to heaven somehow through their own works. And believe in Jesus. 
That says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Great passage to use. Romans 11, out of the last place, you don't even have to turn there. Romans 11, 5 says, Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. You can't have, you can't mix the terms grace and work. They're opposites. They're antonyms. You cannot merge them. They mean the opposite thing. You, can't, you cannot, if you have grace, then you don't have works. They're not exactly antonyms, but they're, 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 you can't combine the two. Because as soon as you mix the two, it just becomes works. When you mix grace and works, well, it's just works then. Because works is works is works, whether you have any degree of what, you know, so-called grace. It's just not, you just can't have it. It's not grace. So if we have to turn from our sins to be saved, but I'm still saved by grace, you've just added works into grace. Can't do that. Then it's not grace. Right. You're not believing in grace. You're not believing salvation by grace through faith. No matter how much you say you believe it, when you believe you have to turn from your sins to be saved, you're not trusting in grace because you've added works. And the Bible says you, you simply can't do that. It's not, it's, it's, it doesn't even make any sense. It's, it's a contradiction of, of terms and you're wrong. So I hope that helps you. you know, again, I, I'm not worried about the people here. I believe you know, you're, you're saved because you know what you believe. But this is to help you because it, it could become real tangled and sticky when you're talking to someone about this repent of your sins thing and people just repeat it because they've heard it over and over and over and over again and usually they're going to need some serious convincing as to why that's wrong. Because when you grow up, you've gone to church your whole life and you've heard this preached over and over again, someone needs to show you some evidence from the scripture. And that's what I showed you this morning. So hopefully you, you have a better answer, better understanding of James chapter 2. Hopefully when you're talking to someone, you could use Romans chapter 4, Acts 19, Jonah chapter 2 or 3, excuse me. You could go to these places and show repenting from sin is not biblical as far as in, in regards to our salvation. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you please help us to become better soul winners. I pray that you would please just help us to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, dear Lord. I pray that you please open up the minds of those people that, that are believing in, uh, in, in this repent of your sins nonsense, that you'd, you'd show them the, the error of their ways and show them how it's based, that that's, it's truly a works-based salvation. God, and help us to show people that and to be very good at expounding your words unto them, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us all to be motivated to, to be in the Bible and to know this stuff for ourselves, not just to agree with it when it's preached, to be able to show other people and teach them the same things that they heard this morning, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.